And welcome to the Elevate Podcast. It's so awesome to have all of you here with us yet one more time. Episode numero dis. 10. 10. Dalton. 10. We made it. 10. Say what? 10. What? 10. My guy, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Tyler, you've been invited into the craziness of the 10th episode of the Elevate Podcast. We're so grateful to have you on with us today. I feel so super excited to be here for number 10. I did not know it was number 10 coming yeah, in. Yeah, the big one out. It's all right. I didn't know that either, except for about two minutes ago when you asked when I which confirmed. episode this was. <laughs> so... Uh, we love having Tyler on. Tyler's done a lot of great work in his communities. Um, he's done a lot of great work here in Halifax, as he is a native Nova Scotian, and he's you know he stayed here after university. He tried to build up what was here, and he got to see the fruits of success as Halifax grew into an amazing tech hub. Then he took his talents over to the capital of the country, and he's been doing some great work over there. And that's just kind of my quick rundown of Tyler Farmer. But today we're going to get into who he actually is, what he's all about, and he's actually got some questions for myself and Dalton too, so wow. it should be a good podcast. Already. The turns have tabled. The turns have tabled. I'll tell you. <laughs> I can't wait to throw it out there. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll start with this question. Is it the good one? Do you really want to go that deep already? Which one? TikTok? Do it. All right. Best. Want me to do it? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So with the recent ban, mm -hmm. or potential ban of TikTok in the States... What is your opinion on government blockades on private sector apps and businesses, along with your opinion on apps collection and use of your data? No softballs here. Yeah, no I softballs. love that. Diving into it, because I'm not going to lie, I think my opinion of TikTok might have been different before today, as it was just released, TikTok announced. They're I know. going to open up the algorithm <laughs> yeah. to vetting. Uh, super excited about that, and I would yep. love to see Facebook and Google. You see Facebook wants to buy it? Oh, of course they do. Today they announced. Yeah. They, yeah. I mean, but, they've been trying to buy it for a while. I yeah. mean, what I think about banning it is... North America has always had a business culture of, you know, that pure capitalism, like you have to fight to be the best. And I really don't, I think that cuts against that culture. Yeah. Honestly. Um, yeah. China has had super predatory practices against our IP and it, we've probably been slow to react, but I don't think this is the best way to do it. If we're playing tit for tat, um, game theory this out, I mean, we're just going to create two separate internets eventually. There's yeah. going to be the U.S. one and China one. Now, they already have our their own, but we've been lucky enough in North America that it's been open and it's free to play. Yeah. And it's kind of challenged a lot of companies to be at best. And yes, there's been some monopolies developed, you could say, around the Facebook and whatnot, yep. but... Really, TikTok might be the only one that's challenging them. Of course, they want to buy them because of that. So it yep. sucks it's a Chinese company, possibly, but you got to keep that spirit going. And that's a tricky route to go down. Yeah. Because what's the next step after that? I mean, World War. Yeah. <laughs> World War. <laughs> that, that was my take last week. Thanks, so TikTok. I just love the theory we should still embrace it. And there's probably another 100 tools in the tool chest we should be looking to. How do we secure and protect our IP against China? Yeah. And, you know, just flat out banning any innovation they have coming our way. Yeah. That's not the way to do it. Yeah. Because that could also lead to maybe one day there's a, uh, an innovation that we might actually want, but they might say, well, you don't want anything from us. Yeah. So you, I feel like putting that blockade up has a permanent stop on. I'll take what? that chance. I'll take that chance any day of the week. Really? Absolutely. Over well-being, I do not care. Over digital well-being or physical? Mm. Both. How do you feel there's a physical well-being impact from an app? Because let's talk about it. We can have the same argument. Yeah, obviously. This just shows you the power of our digital age. Yeah. Twitter single-handedly has that power currently. Right. They, Twitter has attribute, uh, contributed to some of the most divisive times in our country because they censor people already. Mm. Um, and that's our, so if you put all that power into a private company, that's spooky. So I think there is a level of censorship that needs to come in in order just to protect safety of people. Mm. Um, because you have a lot of people, point. you know, people manipulating narratives um, and people getting riled up, getting frustrated, if, yep. you know, and... Mm -hmm. Uh, it hasn't helped peace. You know, the goal is for peace at the end of the day and legit no peace at the end of the day. So that's kind of where I'm at with all. Well, I can dig it. So, yeah. yeah. I always I wonder if that came up, uh, not because, you know, the censorship or anything, but 
there's no other place to go for people. Yeah. Like if you have only say a handful of options to go and you're blocked at one, yes, you might have actually another option to go, but if there's no one there, it's not the same product then. Um, because in relation to the Twitter stuff, you know, you had something like parlor parlay. Come mm-hmm. up. That's been an interesting development. Now it's virtually pretty much a solely a conservative political tool. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And you know, was it is the change worth it, or does it address the does it address the problem? I actually am not familiar with that one too okay. much, but like in theory, um, I'm kind of fine with these other smaller ones coming out and creating niches. The problem is we just don't have enough niches right. to right. split up and break out Twitter. Because if you want to be part of the bigger dialogue, I mean, there's only that's one where you spot. go. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I'm, I talk for, as a Twitter addict. Right. Oh, I from see this, all, so. all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a Twitter creep for sure. Like, I don't tweet a whole lot. No. I, I consume. I'm definitely a Twitter consumer. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is, yeah, I, I just watch what's going on in Twitter yeah. because um, Twitter's a cesspool of negativity. So it can be. Of, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm kind of interested in what your thoughts are around the idea of Twitter creating a subscription model. If, like, a lot of the assumption is it's the ad model and how they get money because they need to get engagement and thus you have to push how polarized things are mm. if you take that model away from them it's purely i gotta pay in order to engage mm. do you think that shifts and might weed out some of the people that are just there to get a rise of people i think yes and no um, yeah you know, you know, you get people are paying like, you know, you're still going to have the New York Times paying. Mm-hmm. CNN's going to pay and um, trolls are also still going to pay. You know, there's an interesting stat I came across. Uh, I need to really look into it myself. I just can't kind of came across it in an article yeah. where, you know, there's a there was a significant rise in just lack of journalism integrity when newspapers realize that they are being taken over by digital. Yeah. Because then uh, CNN, New York Times went into super clickbaity BuzzFeed type stuff. Right. Almost TMZ level of exactly. like scum. And that's kinda yeah. like now that that's kinda what they are now is, you know, they ha- they have their content with a veneer of some journalism, but they just, you know, they they push headlines that just get people going, get more clicks, clicks. get more views. I mean we live in a click based yeah. internet yeah. now. Up, you know, up, right? So and like CPC hard. rates are at an all-time high at the moment in any industry. Yeah, and you know? I pay for my journalism because I've seen the model, but try to explain to the average person, like, you're going to have to cough up money or what you get is unfortunately not going to be the quality you yeah. probably deserve. It's a hard argument to pay, um, to make to say, you went 10 years without paying for journalism because you got it on Facebook, Twitter, but now you're going to have to pay fifty dollars uh, $50 a month to get it from a few sources. I guess we're going back to the fifty cents a paper type of mm-hmm. situation, right? But Amelia, I mean, I I don't think it all not in every aspect, but there tends to be a correlation between paid service and quality in some you know in some industries, some aspects. I wouldn't mind paying a little bit to know I'm reading real media and not like a falsely pushed narrative. So I don't think I, I wouldn't be upset at a subscription model, but it's like you said, CNN's still going to pay. New York Times yeah. is still going to pay. They can afford to like they don't, whatever the cost is, they're going to make it happen. So either way, they stay on Twitter. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's a tough one. Honestly, like we're in a we're in some very polarizing times right now. Um, it's it's I mean, if I'm being honest, uh, I, I have an American wife. I've told her straight up that you know. Uh, now is the time to go see your family. If you can fight your way through the border through COVID to go see your family, do it now. Yeah. Because as your husband, I'm not allowing you to go down to the States post November 4th. Yeah. No matter what the election's results are, it's going to go bonkers. One way or another. Yeah. One yeah. side's upset. Like, yeah. upset. Yeah, like rattled upset. And one side definitely has all the guns. So, uh, yep. hate and to that side that. loses. Yeah. And I hate to say, I don't think we've seen the worst of it yet as a no. lot of the government subsidies and everything haven't ended yet. So we have a lot of companies being helped afloat and unfortunately, you know, they that's all, helping they, a lot of people, but we haven't seen the pain yet. From when that. America crashes, like when businesses crash, it's an uproar. Yeah. Cause the American dream is come and start a business. Mm. When you lose the fundamental American dream, America's really what like what what is America at that point? Because they're a capitalism business. Yeah. When you lose that, it's it's gonna break out. 
Yeah. Well, that's kind of an interesting question then. How would you guys measure the success of the economy going forward as it seems like the stock market there is completely divorced from the outcomes of that, especially where, say, the NASDAQ is mostly made up of a lot of tech companies with their mm -hmm. market caps being so big now. Yeah. So how would you, going forward, if your strategy is based on a measurement of how the impacts being successful or not, how do you look at that? Well, I, think, I, I think part of it is you will start seeing... You're, I think we're going to start seeing the impact very soon. Because as you said, you know, um, eventually the free money, quote unquote, is going to run yeah. out. Uh, then people are definitely going to be on their own. So you won't actually, I don't think we're going to see any impact till two or three months post crash money yeah. Yeah. ending. Uh, then we'll know. And the scary part about that is it's going to happen around the election. Mm -hmm. And and that's where I'm like, you know, as speaking as Canadians, I'm not a moron. I know our economy is very reliant on the American economy. Economy. Yep. yep. So whatever happens to them is going to happen to us. It's a ripple. Way, yeah, we're going to feel it. In some, some way, shape, or form. I mean, it was amazing that, you know, obviously we still felt 2008, but nowhere near as bad as the states felt yeah. it, right? No. So it's going to be something similar. Is whatever hits them, we're still going to feel some of that. Yeah. 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 I think, I think you've got a really good point in, like, what, what's going to happen there. We'll feel a bit of it. Um, but I'm very, I'm very interested to see in terms of what that means. Like, is this going to drive America into a full recession again? I mean, I think... I really, th I see that happening. Uh, at least for the middle to lower class. And 100%. like, yeah, because I mean, they've had like a carrot dangle in front of them with this free money. And that's one day that's going to go away with no help anymore. <laughs> Straight up. And that's why, like, I mean, I'm very stoked in general about Nova Scotia. Um, I'm very positive about what can happen here. Mm. Uh, I've been really psyched about how we've handled COVID stuff. Um, I think it's been doing a good job and even fighting through the COVID stuff. Uh, businesses have still been able to reopen yeah. and be mm -hmm. successful. You've seen a real hustle yeah, from we, business I, owners. I mean, we straight up, I mean, there's no excuse. I'll, I'll shout them out right now. If they ever hear this podcast, I love you guys. You know, we're right above Julep right now. And they're killing it on their patio out here. And restaurants. Like, they're yeah. packed every night. Every night. At and, lunch. And they're just one of many restaurants and many businesses. In the and food services city. already historically not easy to make money in mm -hmm. like i've been shocked coming back here and i actually was expecting the worst coming from ontario been there 10 months knowing how reliant nova scotia is how you know restaurant bar heavy downtown yep. is and how reliant we are on tourism like there's no yeah. cruise liners coming in no. this summer but I've been impressed with the turnout by people to support the local businesses and the i can say yeah. none of my favorites i've we're regulars at mm -hmm. have gone away and talking to the l workers and how things are going, getting a sense of it. They're all quite positive and saying, you know, it might be down a bit, but it's steady. The support Just is the, amazing. The attitude is great. Like how grateful they are that yeah. we're there. Meanwhile, I'm so grateful that they're open. Mm -hmm. So it's just like this, it's that Nova Scotian spirit, how literally everyone's just happy that we can help each other, see each other and help yeah. each other again. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. you know, like for example, it was just my wife's birthday a few weeks ago. And, uh, and so some of our friends down in the States are just like, oh man, sorry that you can't celebrate the way you'd hope for, you know, COVID birthdays are the worst. And she's like, I mean, it might be like that for you guys. Appear but we went to a restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> we went to the bicycle thief, you know, yeah. and, you know, we got to sit on the water and eat our food and around other amazing. couples, around other people. Yeah. You know, it was, it, it, I've, I've honestly speaking out of tremendous gratitude. I'm like almost in some ways driven to tears to see how well we've done. Yeah. Um, to see businesses thrive and do well. Yeah. Um, and being such as uh, we talked about it earlier before we hopped on the podcast of how Halifax really is that, you know, we just kind of blossomed out of nowhere yeah. and we have this resilient spirit to keep businesses alive and do great things. Yeah. I have to say we, it's something that's special about here being able to be lucky enough to see the other provinces and tech ecosystems. Communities are, competitive feature here that yeah. is what we do better than anyone uh people were flabbergasted when i was here in march went to a ux night you were there i believe yes. we had 60 people show up for an after hours event and there were still i think two other tech events that night yep that does not happen anywhere else across canada really anywhere it's like wow. that is our competitive feature of how much we bought into supporting this community huh. And it shows um, just through how we dealt with COVID and now mm. supporting local businesses. And I think it's something we need to be a little louder about because mm -hmm. no one knows that. 
Yeah. Like, unfortunately, Atlantic provinces are the other provinces. <laughs> oh, yeah. We live on our own little yeah. dark corner. Yeah. Yeah. What, but what, what do they say I think is? we're what? slowly, people are starting to figure out, like, we are our best, best kept secret, but we got to change that. Mm-hmm. We can't be anymore, and we got to be a little louder about this. Yeah. Do we, though? Do we want to be louder? I that, think we do. You still want to be, do you want to be running, you know, $600,000 for a one bedroom apartment on Barrington Street? <laughs> we do need to solve that problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you had Sebastian on a few podcasts ago yeah. and I'm pretty sure he'd be an advocate for people moving out to Picto and to oh, rural areas. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And if anyone's interested in moving out to Halifax, like tech out, like Wolfville. Some of the so I or, love like, Wolfville. So like, true, yeah. If you can work from home, you're only half an hour from city to an hour from the city. There are some amazing spots. So you're like five minutes from a winery. Yeah. Yeah. Some Anyone interested in Halifax coming from afar, talk to a local and just ask what's half an hour away. You'd be blown away. dude. I, I, that's why I love this province. And it was funny when we were kind of in our separate uh, provincial bu- bubbles at first. And, you know, like, you know, I just, it sucked that I couldn't go to, you know, wherever. But I honestly didn't feel it much because we have so much here in nova scotia to go explore and do things honestly i felt bad for the other provinces because staycations have been a big thing this year straight up yeah you know but like we got cape breton you know beautiful we got oh i got a rep cape breton that's where my family's from honestly best part of the province go straight up to the highlands do around the cabot trail and honestly there's got a hot little tech sector up there that people overlook yeah well that's why i love to hear man I mean, I know, I know they're really pushing uh, uh, tourism and people moving here when Trump got elected. So, yeah, <laughs> people did. Did they actually? Did we see an influx of numbers? I, I mean, know. not enough. I don't think it was measurable. Yeah. But I mean, I'm sure that a few people took it seriously. You know, unfortunately, we do need a lot more coming there. That island specifically, net loses a thousand people a year. So oh. we still need to look to create a lot more people coming here, whether it's through immigration or convincing people, you know, if they're going to hire work from home, some beautiful land up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So sh- I have a question about that, though. Speaking as someone who is from away. Yeah. How do we solve that issue? So I'll be honest, speaking as someone, who, you know, I've been here for nine years now. I'm still seen by some of my friends who are from here as you're not, you know, you're from way, you know, you're not one of us. Yeah. And in a lot of ways you can be shut out. Uh, you know, it's one, I feel that one way as a white dude, but people who actually come from like visible minorities from away can really feel the separation and the exclusivity moving here. Like, it's like, I don't know if Scotia is always weird like that. It's like, they're mm-hmm. super nice to your face, but then like, they've got a narrative in their head. Yeah. It's yeah. so weird, you know? And like, but you like you, they'll block you out of their life if you're not, from here yeah and i i I always found that odd and so i want to speak to both you since you're both from here yeah like where does that come from and uh, you know i honestly my opinion is nova scotia has almost everything going for it and the only thing holding us back is cultural Mm -hmm. and unfortunately it's one of those things like that um part of my job where i was at previously digital nova scotia I always just want to be a connector. I always talk to companies was the biggest pain point. It's finding talent, talent in the mid to senior level, whatever. And we had so much talent just coming from afar, but I would hear the same story going over and over. I've been here X amount of months. I've applied eight, given out 80 resumes. I'm not hearing back. What we aren't telling them is unfortunately our culture here is you have to go network handshakes you gotta talk to them you gotta ask for the job you gotta be friends you gotta ask for a tour of the office and that's really great that's what makes community here but there's a downside right there's a downside to that unfortunately where we do maybe have to start checking our biases on that yeah especially like i hear a lot we don't hire for skill we'll train you we hire for fit but that's a two-edged sword also yeah to hire for fit, unfortunately, if you get a little lazy, a little tired, that just means some guy you like to have a drink with. And that might be why we're struggling with getting people from afar into jobs, getting women into tech. Yeah. And it's those things you'd never know to check. But it's something we do from a cultural point of view have to take a serious look at mm-hmm. because we got everything else going for us. The only thing is talent and we need more people to come here. Yeah, I was uh, just talking to my boss last night. And, uh, you know, he's from Toronto, did um, crazy amount of business in New York City, 
uh, lived down there for a certain amount of time, moved back to Toronto. Uh, the one thing he said is he really, like, he's like, you know, he's been around the world on business in various parts. And he's like, he's like, honestly, there's no place like Halifax, Nova yeah. Scotia. Like it really is. Yeah. They really are like they have, he said, and he, and he said his exact, his exact words where he's like, they're Nova Scotia, Halifax is the best tech bubble in the country mm-hmm. outside of Vancouver, outside of Toronto. Halifax is the place to be for tech, which is like, that's saying someone who's been around. Yeah. Really who's see, seen those cities. Exactly. Yeah. He's really seeing us as the San Francisco of Canada, which is really intriguing. What are your thoughts on that? Do you see the same thing? <laughs> I am starting to see the same things. I think we've gotten to a point and I think the we do have to progress to the next level and get a little more busy business savvy about yeah, what we're right. doing. I think we've gotten to the point where we can claim that. Mm-hmm. We can own that and be proud. But we, we kind of have it. to do look and be like, all right, how do we get to the next stage? Because when it comes to what you measure in strategy, if you look at the one Nova Scotia report card, the number of startups we're creating has flattened out number of exports flattened out the r d from the um secondary um education schools has flattened out so we need to take a second look and be like how do we iterate on what were our plans going forward mm. and the other thing is we have to stop being the best kept secret we have to be yeah. more voiceful. Yeah. Like through my work at ICTC, we're talking to people in the EU regarding the CETA deal, which has mm. been super beneficial for anyone looking for labor and IT, looking to sell over there, get investment from over here, back here. One of the quotes there is, unheard is unloved. That's and that's one. what they're saying is Nova Scotia, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada, whatever. We know you're a nice spot. We know you're a great cultural fit for EU better than US. Quality of life, amazing. We just don't know anything but who more are about you? you. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's awesome. That it, it really is. That it represents us so well. Like, that's totally on brand. We don't want to grow up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we leave it the way we found it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Straight up. Please don't build any more than 15 floors. <laughs> I mean, I'm like that. I die if my favorite dive bar went away so True. i love yeah. the creeks and the floors oh, but for sure mm-hmm. i don't know that's my thought on it and what mm-hmm. i've seen afar i'd love to hear your thoughts dalton yeah so i think um it's hard to say i um, i don't know i really think that we do need to be louder i think that nova scotia really has not been put on a map sometimes it's been put on the map in a bad way mm. um like you said, like the, the the afterthought province, the not have province. But then people come here like, you know, like our boss or, you know, other investors or like networking events. And people can see like the passion that people have for the work they do here, which screams that should scream to investors. But we're not being to the extent that we could be in terms of marketing our own city, yeah. you know, putting our name out there, showing people that the talent we have is some of the best some of the smartest some of the most innovative but i think it's owning that too i'm just going to say this yeah. uh, from two people who've been in nova scotia a while yeah you probably heard this the five meeting five handshake deal yeah right like that is the most east coast thing and yep. it's unfortunately it deters business it does. i know so many people have started up businesses here from san francisco some of them being like ideally by the numbers this is the perfect spot to be Yep. Time zone wise, close to New York. Yeah, you have the talent, you have the education, but I can't do business there because I gotta have five handshakes before I can talk to about the deal. Yeah, it's so and true. We were just talking about that with Sebastian a few weeks back, where it's like that's literally how business is done here. Is like you start bringing up business right away, and we start freaking out. Like, hey, he's there, man. We'll just have some pizza first. Yeah, yeah it's like how, yeah. <laughs> well, that's just it, you, you, it's there is an unfortunate. I'll, I'll use the word old school mentality to business here across n- not even just tech, like really yeah. in, in any operation, I'd say in Halifax and Nova Scotia, where it is like that. It's like, let's go get a beer after work and I want to get to know you. But to a business person from LA or New York, mm-hmm. I want numbers meeting one. Yep. Why do I want to spend my money? Absolutely. Where here it's like, I'll tell you why I spend your money on the fifth meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People from LA and New York don't have time for a fifth meeting. Mm-hmm. They barely have time for one. 
Right. So, you know, I learned this big time. I worked in oil and gas before I found my way into tech and oil and gas is exactly what you expect on Canadian business. Yeah. You know, shake hands, takes five handshakes. Yep. You get to know each other, drinks, you get the contract, you can make a few airs. Everyone's kumbaya as long as you're <laughs> friends. Yeah. 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 That's an air. <laughs> <laughs> but I had the chance to go down to the States one time and my mentor was like, I, I'm going to show you how business is done down here because it's going to be your biggest learning lesson. Um, it was a big RFP. We had five companies get together and they're like, all right, we're all the competitors for this. We're going to draw this up and we're going to agree on a price. And we're going to make sure everyone gets a piece. Done. Wow. First meeting. Flat out. Not joking around. We're Left with a deal. Yeah. I love that. Not here. <laughs> yeah. That would never happen, like, yeah. here. But you that was be, You wouldn't even lead meeting. with an RFP here. That wouldn't even be your lead here. No, yeah. absolutely not. No. Your lead be like, wow. hey, did you play golf this weekend? Mm. <laughs> That's my lead. And if not, do you want to play with me next? Yeah. So like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude, that's, you know, it, it's so intriguing, right? Like, oh, man, we have, we, Dalton and I talk about it all the time, uh, where we, it's really is a love-hate relationship with this province, where it's like, man, like, there's so much potential, but we, like, we are the ones who hold ourselves back so much of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, and hopefully it'll, the growth will be there eventually. Uh, but yeah, because like there was so much potential here. You said it like, you know, everyone sees all the universities that, that are here, the education we have here, yep. the talent that's coming out of these schools is not yep. like the fact that we can't retain most of the talent that comes out of these schools is so tough. That's a heartbreaking thing. Like, honestly, if we could keep every graduate that came out in a year and I don't blame the companies for so many companies taking class loads, mm-hmm. yep. but you know, we need to figure out a way to progress them further to beyond the junior level jobs because the companies here are screaming for that mid to senior level talent. And, you know, that's the hard one to pry from Toronto. So well, because they're how being do paid we, the big bucks. Yeah. You know, so how do we start progressing the junior talent here faster and keep them engaged? Well, so this is something I heard from one of the bigger companies in the area. I won't name them, uh, but this is kind of something that was you know, they're kind of known for, uh, and this is something we kind of try to figure out, uh, is they, they would be, they're known to bring on a lot of junior talent, mm-hmm. but they didn't have the work coming in. So they'd bench yeah. them for months mm-hmm. yeah. and then there's the get they sick and tired of them and they, they leave, you know, and that's another it, part of the issue is like, how do we really develop talent? And that's something personally I'm very passionate about is finding talent and developing it. Like even as I'm starting my own company, like, like I almost want to take, what our boss did is our boss, like it's amazing that the, the risk he took on our company, he was in New York, hired all of his employees here remotely. He never met us in person before hiring us, put us up in a building over in Purdy's wharf and trusted the work was going to get done. I love this story. You know, this is the first thing I learned home. when I met you and that I love that story. Right? It's like, it's nuts. Like, we were all first, like, we're all just fresh out of school. And he's like, yeah, we're, we'll have some fun. Here's some this. laptops. Seriously. And then now that company grew from a $500,000 a year company to now we're doing four, 4.5 million. You know, it's just like, what happened? You know, it's amazing. I well, love there, the trust there. There's huge opportunity in Nova Scotia alone to engage these students. Like, they're super bright. They know what the future is going to look like. They yep. have the base skills coming of our education system. Yep. But I think the last stat I saw was 21% of Nova Scotian company, Atlantic Canadian companies have a digitalization plan. Like I was just chatting with someone the other day saying most of the organizations in the mortgage industry, real estate, um, you could go down the line. They haven't even adopted proper CRM best practices or a CRM. Which hurts me a lot. Yeah. It's 2020 and it blows my mind. But there must be a way to engage youth and be like, look, let's start going out and engaging these youth and getting these businesses on board. Proper digitization talked about Ignite with their e-port plan of getting people on board, just simply in rural towns with e-commerce. Like there is so much you could do just by doing basic uh, practice like that and getting people on board and a few best practices. Like there's a huge opportunity there, I think. Absolutely. Perfect. Exactly what you just brought up with ePort and what uh, Sebastian and Ignite are doing over there. I think that's a fantastic tool that they're launching. Yeah. And it's such a great start to be able to get 
businesses engaged out in the rural communities in Nova Scotia. Because yep. as you said, like there's, there's some serious hot beds of tech town in this province outside of Halifax. And I'm like, the future of Nova Scotia is super bright, I find, as long as we keep on that. Like we yeah. were talking about earlier about trying to have a bigger mentality. And I know you have your reservation res- reservations, Dalton. But what? So about what? You'll see. Ooh. You'll see. Ooh. But I loved this move that our mayor made, you know, I think a year ago when he's like, you know, it's a long shot, but we'll, s- we'll see if we can get Amazon here. You know, I loved that move um, because he knew it at least most likely wasn't going to happen, but it was just having the mentality that we can acquire big fish is amazing. I love that. I love that so much. Even if you know it's a 0%. You made the ask and you got noticed probably by who knows how many people. Yeah. But it's the start and it starts oh, yeah. letting people know we can do this. Mm-hmm. Like we have data with my work showing talking to people in the EU, they aren't even aware of our super clusters, which are supposed to mm. be our commercialization engines for a lot of industries and business development mm-hmm. overseas. We need to start going out there. And I love that one because it wasn't just a big ask internally in Canada, it's going out to the U.S. and being like, hey, we want to play in this. Absolutely. Yeah. Even that deal they, they nailed with eBay, I mean, it was a small thing, but it was cool. I did not a fully understanding what it actually is, but the fact yeah. they're trying to get eBay. Like it's still, yeah. It's still a thing, which is, you know, showing effort, which is nice. Well, I remember how excited we got when web.com opened up shop here mm-hmm. as well. I mean, that that was, I mean, they brought a lot of jobs here. Mm-hmm. They're, they are mostly tech related as well. You know, there's a lot of in-house tech at web.com. So, and I have to give them props for hiring. I think it was, I'm not going to quote the number because I don't know off the yep. top of my head, but significant number of people down Yarmouth way. Yep. And for anyone that doesn't know, that's a good four hours away from Halifax. That's the other end of the province. That is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Southern tip almost. Yeah. But yeah. they pulled it off. Super successful. Been yep. there long-term, super yep. sustainable. Very successful. So it shows you can do it anywhere. Yep. You just got to, you got to ask. anywhere. Yeah. I love that. You got to ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. And that, that's exactly where we're at. You know, and that's kind of, you know, something I'm super passionate about with my business is like, I definitely want to see it grow. I want to grow a good solid you do? team. Oh yeah. Just, oh, I, I thought you wanted to stay where you were. Uh, just be one person. Yeah. No. Just no growth. No growth. No, 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 not at all. We don't believe in growth. Dude, I'm not going to lie. That was initially my my motivation when I first started. I was like, I'm just literally <laughs> starting a company so I can buy a Tesla. That was literally my only motivation <laughs> when I started. Oh, my God. I was like, I mean, gosh. Who hasn't had that motivation? Yeah, straight out. I was like, if I can just get some nice side money. I live right by Shopify in Ottawa, and I tell you, <laughs> oh, I see them every yeah. day. Oh, of course. That yeah. must be nice. I want to be one of the few that have one here. Um, There's more and more. I know. That's why more I'm, and more, dog. Stop talking. Okay. So to keep on this trend, I got a question with you for your business. We're talking about getting out there, being loud, being proud of what's here. What's your distribution strategy for getting people to know about you and what you have to offer? Great question. Uh, first off, I've been actually taking the Nova Scotia way of doing business. Is I've been really <laughs> trying to get out there on networking events, talk to people, see what's going on, and, and not be too pushy. Uh, you know, just let them know what I do, what we're offering, what my plans are. Mm-hmm. Um, but my big goal is... You know, I just, you know, we're seeing such a, a demand for UX across the country and such a dry up of supply talent that that's what my distribution strategy is, is to become the company that can be the in-house design agency for a company and, you know, and keep growing it from there and then bring in all my, all like, cause I have a lot of connections in UX and I have a lot of connections to uh, students and universities here too, uh, just because of just how things happen and people you meet this at the other. Uh, but my goal is I just want to keep, you know, pulling in, you know, the Charles way of doing things is just keep pulling in kids, teach them how to do UX because mm-hmm. that's the thing that's me t- tick, ticks me off about a school that's just down the street from here. <laughs> um, they are so, they, they're so poor in teaching digital strategy and tech, tech to these design students that it like they they don't really they're not getting much like I'm taught like I'm live I've had meetings and meetings with all these students that are supposed to be in their third and fourth years and they don't know anything and I'm kind of like what are they what's going on yeah and so I'm taking it on myself as I'm like I eventually you know want to grow this company to the point where I can actually have my own cohort of students mm-hmm. on a yearly basis where I have ten or fifteen that I can just teach them about UX teach them how to do, how to do the design to get jobs whether it be with me or other people. Um, to go do great things. That's kind of my strategy is essentially start building from the bottom up of just create a foundation of great students who want to just do great work, yeah. see how they flourish, 
hopefully they can well, they want to work for me so we can build out this like you know since this massive team to go and do some damage yeah i don't know if i want to keep that public or not in terms of uh you know letting everyone know that's what i want to do but <laughs> i'm a competitive person and i'm letting the whole world they're on notice Josh, you guys come on depth experience design. So. Well, I can tell you from the research we're doing, that is one of the most in demand roles across the province, uh, mm-hmm. especially shockingly. I didn't realize this Alberta. It is huge there. Wow. Um, specifically really? when you're with oil and gas companies and you have to convince someone that hasn't been around digital space as much. You have to make that sales pitch in five minutes. Yep. UX is super critical. I believe it was number four of the top 10 in demand jobs there. Wow. And I can tell you, we just did a research into AR VR. Oh, it's, baby. Whoa. Yes. That's, that's Talk about I'm the mother about. load for needing UX and yeah, storytelling. Baby. You stinking know it. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Wow. Dude, I'm obsessed huh. with AR VR, bro. Oh, yeah. I'm just like, it is very exciting. Feature. And there's some really nice hidden companies here in Nova Scotia doing interesting things. I love that. You know, that means I got to keep my, my ear to the ground. Keep yeah. it going. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's kind of you know what I, what I would like to do. It's what I like to see happen, um, and uh, and just honestly have fun. Like that's just my biggest thing is just to build a company and have fun with it and see what happens and have some great clients and do some great work and uh, yeah. And I think that's the thing is I just I just I really hate the the typical agency model. Mm-hmm. It's part of the reason why I also started this. Dude, agencies are trash. They really are. I, I, I just, you know, seeing how they're structured, like, I just don't want to be like that. Like, I was just talking to a client the other day. Uh, you know, we're talking hours. You know, the client was really caught up on hours. How many hours? You hours is the biggest keyword in agencies, and it's awful. Yeah, and I, and I was, like, doing my best to, like, try to educate them out of that. I'm like, yes, I'm giving you design hours, but the problem I have with agencies is they charge everything it's for the client. billable hours yeah. to them. Everything, yeah. yeah. Oh, we had a, we had a, we each had a, you know, we had three people on, on, sorry, four people in on a 15 minute meeting. That's one hour of just to talk about your so project. So I got to ask you, so you're probably doing value bri- based pricing. Absolutely. How do you go about educating a client on that mm, and setting expectations yeah. for that? It's a great question. That's actually something I'm trying to figure out right now. Cause obviously you're, at some point you're going to get a client who's really going to abuse that. Obviously, mm. you know, the one thing I've been telling my clients is, you know, as I'm starting out, you, I am pitching myself as the in-house design team. So you're going to get the benefit of having an in-house design team. So yeah, you're going to get your design work, but you literally can call me or email me at any time. I will answer and we will talk about your project. I don't know how I'm going to deal with an abuse of that. I still have to figure that mm-hmm. out. Um, but I also, that also comes down to engaging your client. Yes. Yeah. You know, reading I, the room. Exactly. I've been in enough client meetings where I can read who I want to work with and who I don't want to work with. Uh, and I can tell who's going to abuse my time. I'm glad you brought that up because in my experience, yeah, the rules are great to get you started and all those best practices, but you fastly learn in year one, year two dealing with clients, you can throw all those at the window and you got to deal with the person mm-hmm. because they're all different. Oh, they're so yep. different. Yep. But I think that's why I've really, and he'll say it himself, that's why I've loved working for Charles because he says he's he's not exactly the easiest person to work for because his mind's always changing. He's mm-hmm. always got another dream of something he wants to do. <laughs> Uh, and being a designer, uh, uh, working for him, trying to essentially gauge and help, help him narrow his vision has given me a lot of great practice. Um, yep. cause I, I, there's very few people that are like him, I find. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he, he's given me a lot of good practice of how to, it's fascinating that. to watch. Oh, absolutely. Like the serial entrepreneur mind. I love it. Like he's always mm-hmm. thinking of something new. He's always on. Meanwhile, oh, I'm like, awesome. I don't like. I think of myself as fairly entrepreneurial, but I mean, like, to see someone constantly trying to innovate every day is, I've never seen that before. No. So I have to yeah. ask, bringing it back to the Nova Scotia and being loud and proud about what we are, what is it that Charles could teach us then about doing that? As obviously someone that picked Halifax of Obscurity to say, yes, I'll create another team here, um, obviously looked well outside of what his comfort zone may have been, how do we start doing that for companies here? So let me see, I'm trying to, trying to gauge your question a little bit here. So you're just kind of asking how can we, you know, you've seen what Charles has done. How can we essentially help companies to kind of take that? Mentality? Exactly. Um, it's a great question. The one it was funny. There's one thing he, uh, he was actually nominated for one of the EY awards last year. Um, so he came out here at the convention center and, 
Um, this was one thing that, again, he blew his mind about Nova Scotians. And uh, so he, it was a great night, a lot of fun. And a woman got up uh, who was working for, I believe, CTV. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, we'd love to hear any of your guys' stories anytime. Please hit me up, email me. We'd love to get you on this, that, the other. And, it, you know, she got off. It ended. And Charles looked around the room. And not one person went up to this woman. He was like, are you guys kidding me? This woman's working for a media company. And she just said, I have room to put you in. Just come talk to me. And not mm-hmm. one person went up to him. And so he went, took our sales girl. And uh, they went and tra- charted up to her. He's like, hey, we'd love to be on. We got this going on, this going on, this going on. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll make it happen. You know, and that's just like, it's just trying to educate that mentality of like, it's okay to get what you need. Grab you know? the yeah. bowl, buy so the horns. Literally, like she put the offer out. Like it's not even like you're like, And everyone was leaving. Yeah. You know, like it was right there. So I think it's really having that mentality that, you know, it's okay to like, just go get what is yours. Yeah. You know, I mean, I find most people, I go to a lot of conferences for my own job and I've been yep. the person to run up to people after they spoke because it was super, super interesting. People go there because they want to speak about their stuff and engage with their people interested and, yeah, in their stuff. Yeah. Like that is the best opportunity. That is almost a free pass to be a bit annoying and pull them aside and pick absolutely. their ear. Pick their brain, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, you can get so much free time with people by doing that. It's true. And that's up. a great point, uh, great advice for anyone here. Yeah, like even like that's kind of what I loved even going to the Canucks conference in Ottawa. Mm. Uh, you know, I got to meet a lot of cool people. The one guy actually I'm going to really try to uh, to get on this podcast is uh, I totally forget his first name, but Woodbridge, uh, VP f- uh, for Lyft, and uh, literally one of my favorite individuals to talk to because he reminds me a lot of myself. Uh, super loud, super go getter, um, but he's done so much great work for Ottawa. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever got a chance to meet him at all? No, I haven't. Um, uh, super awesome. I dude. might hit you up for yeah. contact later, though. Yeah, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I would love to get you guys in touch. He's such a he's a great guy. I met him through the Canucks conference because he's been the MC every year, um, and uh, and I he the thing I love about him is his humility. Uh, you know, super obnoxious. Loves to, you know be fun. Go yep. lucky, do yep. his thing, but when you talk to him, you have no idea that he literally is the the thinking mind that he is. You know, like he just like he played himself down. He's like, yeah, I just kind of do some marketing stuff. Mm-hmm. Is that the other? Then you end up finding out later on LinkedIn that he's the VP at Lyft, <laughs> re- representing the interests of Lyft in Canada. Right. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> what? So you're just yeah. doing a little marketing? Yeah, <laughs> so just a little bit, right? With only a little bit of competition. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But he's literally like he's done work. He's done work with Gary Vaynerchuk. Got him Whoa. In, literally, he was the guy who got him in contact with Shopify to help out with some different things, get some projects going between the two. Whoa. Like he's done so much. And uh, I'm like, good for him, you know? And that's the type of guy. Like, I love him. I love yeah. people like that. You need to bring him to the East Coast. I do. Honestly, that's one thing we shouldn't be shy about is bringing talent like that here to speak to the people. Because Mm -hmm. honestly, everyone I know that's been brought here that I would consider a big name, they love it. Yeah, They love the lobster. They love the beer. They love the scenery. It's People love it here. And we need to start playing to that to start attracting big talent. If we can get big names here speaking. Yeah. You know what? People are going to want to stay because they're like, why do I got to move to Toronto and pay X amount for rent when exactly. I know that person's going probably also speak in Halifax Especially, when yeah. I and I can learn from them there. Yeah. Especially when I found out, you know, home prices in Guelph are now going for $500,000. Oh. I'm like, yeah, shout out Guelph. <laughs> wow. Guelph. <laughs> wow. I remember when that was like, uh, that was the slums. Sticks yeah. When I lived there. So, <laughs> the boonies. Yeah, yeah. Straight out. I like, lived in the West end of uh, Toronto. I lived in Etobicoke yeah. growing up. And uh, yeah, Guelph was an eternity away. Now, now they're going for five hundred thousand. Like, get Oof. out of my face! That's nuts. <laughs> get out of my face! Straight up, like Tyler. This is what's messed up, man. Okay, so I'll give you an idea. Yeah, a little bit of a digression. So, growing up, we bought a house in my parents bought a house. Oh yeah, in Toronto, West End, Toronto, Royal York and Bloor, for about four hundred thousand dollars in two thousand and four. At what intersection? Uh, Royal York and Bloor. Wow. And Bloor, okay. Yeah, so wow. yeah, it was close. Literally, yeah. we're like the street that we're on was TTC, got on a bus, got a subway, could get downtown within 25 minutes. Okay. Um, super quick. And then, you know, they ended up, you know, getting a job out here, sold, and came out. That house now, $400,000 in 2020, 
is now worth two and a half million. <sighs> That's crazy. It's a three bedroom, sixteen hundred square feet, bo- square foot place. It's not anything spectacular. Now I love this transition to real estate because Please. we can uh, <laughs> talk to Dalton here and get his views. What's host. happening to Halifax right now? Yeah, because it's blowing my mind just being back here a couple months and yeah. what's changed in the last ten months. Yeah, there has been a huge shift in like we all have been talking about wanting to be in Halifax. Obviously, that has a direct correlation on where people need to live. So with vacancy rates now below one percent. Um, it's incredibly expensive to try and find somewhere on wow. the peninsula to live. On average, if you're talking from here to, like from Barrington Street to maybe Shabucto, Oxford, and stay in by the Rotary, so like mm-hmm. sort of like the, the main part of Halifax, I'll say, a two-bedroom, in-suite laundry, parking, you know, it's seventeen to $2,000 a month, you know, for sure. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's not yeah. the Halifax I grew up with. Yeah. No, no, especially when it was and what's crazy is I mean, even now, like the all the properties that I operate are all owned through uh, like mm-hmm. a real estate company now. Ten years ago, it was just mom and pops that owned their house and they rented a side, owned a house, rented a side. And it was like eight hundred bucks a month cash. Like we don't tell anyone. But yeah. now because there's such a need, everything is so professional that I mean just even with me, just to get an apartment in a duplex house, it's an application. It's a credit check. Mm-hmm. It's a full meeting. It's like managing expectations with a full 21 long list of rules. Like, because the market is so not there. Like, there, there's not enough rentals to go around. You have to be so selective with who you rent to. So I'm kind of interested from the business point of view, getting into this, obviously from a renter side, you know, it's difficult prices going up but getting into it from business side and being newer to it what are the barriers you're facing because i imagine you know that means increased prices for you too yeah because it all so falls downhill yeah so there's definitely um you know you're paying more to purchase the property that you Mm -hmm. want to rent um which that obviously means you have to charge more for rent um, so I've spoken about this a couple times with Josh and, you know, just in general, um, I work extremely hard to keep everything as affordable as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, I obviously can't price myself too low. Um, I also can't price myself too high. Yeah. Um, however, I feel there's a lot of people that are pricing themselves too high. So what I try and do is purchase in neighborhoods that are gentrifying rather than gentrified. Mm -hmm. so i'm not focusing on peninsula halifax i can't win here yeah it's like i have one here and i the me looking for new ones is not it because i have a couple criteria when i look at entering into a new investment i have to live in it if i wouldn't feel comfortable spending a night let alone a year in the apartment i can't possibly take money off someone and expect them to live in it so what that means is i try and buy ones that are already renovated Mm -hmm. that are, you know, to a standard that is, I would say, you know, completely remodeled, completely, you know, redone. So yeah, I pay a little bit more for that. Yeah. Um, but I don't increase the rent because of that. Um, I just don't think there's a need. I can still make profit. Mm -hmm. Um, well, good profit and I can still provide homes for people. The biggest thing is anyone can provide someone a house. I work really hard to provide someone a home. So whether that means I work closely with certain contractors to build that working relationship to help lower costs, to seek grants or subsidies from Efficiency Nova Scotia, from the Nova Scotia government, anything that I can do to lower the costs, get money into my business, you know, that's what I have to do. I can imagine that's going to be huge upsides. People's going to be working from home and it's no longer... uh where they wake up, sleep, and have dinner. Like it's, it's where they properly live, work, everything it's now. It's everything now. And you can't expect someone to do that in a dingy basement apartment. No. It's like it's it's not fair for the amount of rent that people are charging and the lack of offerings that are there. Um, too long, no Halifax landlords have, you know, lived rich, let the mm-hmm. tenants suffer. Um they become very defensive as soon as questions are asked. They, they, they're not approachable. Um, and like you said earlier, there's a lack of that tech in the real estate business, like yeah. a CRM or a proper tenant portal. 
I don't need to offer a tenant portal for a duplex. Th- 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 that expectation is not there, but I do. Yeah. Because there's an expectation from the people that I'm renting to that services like that are in place. So the main thing that I've built my company upon is financial success is the byproduct of treating your clients with respect, dignity, and trust. If you can't give your tenants those three things, you're not running a real estate business. That's, it's not what it's about. Real estate is no longer landlord takes money. Landlord goes on vacation. Mm -hmm. Landlord is involved every single day in the tenant's success. At least I am. If they come to me and said, I'm really interested in buying a house and I might be moving out. What can I do for you? You know that I know how to buy property because you're living in one of mine. How can I help you on your journey and take that next step? It's not an issue to me that you want to leave. You're going to buy a house. That's a big deal. T- landlords historically would be like, what do you mean you're leaving? Yeah. What am I going to do? To me, it's like, what an incredible milestone. How can I help you get there? Yeah. What do you need from me? So I'm, ju- I'm going to be the one that makes a lot of landlords upset in the city. And I have no problem being that person. I love that. I feel like that should be enshrined somewhere as tenant success. Tenant success. That is fantastic. I haven't heard that before, but that is awesome. The goal is not to rent forever. Yeah. For most people. Yeah. If I can get them there, then I think I've done a pretty good job as a landlord. So I'm someone that's in the mid 30s. I know a lot of my friends that, you know, they buy a house and they're looking at income property and things like that now yep. to build out a portfolio now looking to yep. actually plan for retirement because I don't think many people my age did in their 20s. Right. But what kind of advice would you have for them? Like throwing around like tenant success, what are kind of the checklists they should be going through before they commit to something like this before they're over their head? Yeah. So the biggest thing that you want to look at is are you mentally and physically prepared to be at someone's beck and call pretty much 24 seven? Because if a pipe bursts at 3 Mm a.m., it's not going to stop being burst until you wake up at 8 a.m. Right. It's going all night. Are you prepared to take that call and not sound like a bear? Because you, you, they didn't ask for the pipe to break. Yeah. So you can't be upset with them. That's just life. So if you're, if you're ready to take that on and ready to be that landlord, that's number one. And then you have to think about who do you want to rent to? Are you buying in an area that's more prone to student housing? Are you buying in an area that's more prone to maybe uh, senior housing? You just have to know your audience mm-hmm. because you're going to be inundated with responses from a certain demo. And if you're not prepared for that, it might come as a shock. So you want to understand the area that you're in and the demo that's going to be applying for the apartment. And then the last thing that I think any new landlord should take into consideration is the amount of free tools that are available. So using, you know, online tenant portals that are already free or in like five bucks a month. Yeah. You know, there's a ton of programs through like Equifax and TransUnion mm-hmm. uh, built specifically for landlords to run full applications, credit checks. Um, you know, it's, it's making sure that you are doing past tenancy verifications, calling employers to see that there is steady income, which can be kind of intimidating to someone who's not a landlord. Like, what do you yeah. mean? I have to call and, and ask to talk about an employee. Like you, you're allowed to do that, but it, yeah. it, sometimes that can be a little, am I, am I allowed? Should I, should I just trust them? Um, as much as I'm all for trust, I'm all for trust once there's sort of an, an, a, on paper, a, a segue into that unconditional trust. Mm-hmm. Um, just proof. You know, yeah. I'll use the word proof. But once they're in, it's like, we're going to ride this. I'm going to give you your space. Um, we're going to have a mutual understanding of respect on both sides. And there's no reason that we can't all just get along in harmony. But uh, to plan for a retirement and to buy an income property, I think, is one of the best things you can do especially if you know you're buying a duplex or a triplex. If you're buying a triplex, you're now generating profit because one unit can pay your mortgage and one, yeah. can, one can go into savings. If you're buying a duplex, the other unit should at least pay your mortgage. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, it's going to cost. And if the idea is to break even, to be paid off you know, in 30 years for when it is time to retire, then you want one that's at least going to cover the mortgage payment. That's awesome. That's actually some great business advice that, like at a base level of know yeah. your customers, know the tools out there that are super cheap that you can use yeah. and respect the space of yeah. your customer yeah. and build that trust. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's their home. Yeah. You know, you're, you're leasing them a home. So it's no different than if I just walked into Josh's owned home 
it's no different. I can't just barge in. It's that respect, you know, knowing the legal rights that they have and the legal rights that you have, you know, in case you ever have to play that game. Um, Cause there's, it's going to happen everyone. There's going to be a tenant. Mm-hmm. That's a bit of a nightmare. Legal is going to get involved and it's going to be expensive and it might make you want to quit, but that's just part of business. The, the bad things happen, but just knowing that, you know, a simple email saying, I'm going to be on site tomorrow, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., whatever. There's a big job we have to do. You know, we apologize for any noise. Perfect. Every tenant that comes into any of my properties on day one, there's always an edible arrangements and a grocery store gift card. When they leave, there's a grocery store gift card. At the holidays, there's a grocery store gift card. That's such a minor thing. Yeah. But doesn't everyone love a little something that just shows, like, we truly care we hope this helps. We know moving is hard and expensive. Mm-hmm. Here's a gift card to, you know, take care of some groceries because we know you just paid for movers. It's not hard. It's not hard. I always had a golden rule. Anytime I do anything for clients, it's always 10 to 20% above what I knew my competition's doing. Yep. Just, you got to do it and it will pay back tenfold. Because if my success can be two things, I'd be extremely happy. One, financial. Obviously, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not in business to just break even. No one is. That's life, you know? But two, if I can make every other landlord in the city upset and realize they have to change, I single-handedly can start a movement of creating better landlords because there's such a mass of landlords who just don't care. Yeah. So if I can make every single one of them angry and realize their business is at risk, I have no problem winning by that. That is awesome. I always say whenever I hear someone say they're a disruptor or anything, I was like, show the receipts. And it sounds like you're well on your way to that. Oh, I have no problem. Yeah. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's why that's what we got in common. We just love upsetting people. Listen, <laughs> some people need to be upset to realize they're wrong. Straight up. You're right. I just love how this podcast went from, uh, you know, Josh and Dalton hosting to Tyler hosting. I know. <laughs> Sorry. No, <laughs> no look, this that's amazing. good. Yo, this has been like, oh, this has been awesome. I, I told you guys, I had questions for you guys. I've I been love intrigued. It. I've listened I love to it. the episodes and I was always wanted to, I know I want to dive in your brain, Josh, before, um, and then hearing about real estate. Yeah. Now, I'm new to that, but yeah. That's awesome. It's an and game. honestly, everything you're listing is all the best practices anyone should be doing in business, dealing with just clients. in general, even business. in a bad yep. situation. Like that's how you prep and yep. make sure you're coming out ahead, turning a bad situation into a good one. Yep. And the expectations. The thing I've learned is in a bad situation, especially with tenants, tenants usually only call when there's something wrong yep. for the most part. So they're going to call. They're going to say, like I said, pipes broken. They're likely to be a little upset just because there's water in their apartment understandable i would be upset Mm -hmm. the worst thing a landlord could do is show up and go oh i guess i'm here where is it at like let me see blah 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 that's the you you do not have to become attackative there's absolutely no need you can just it's not hard to call a plumber no and you're just gonna have to pay what it costs you're calling them at 3 a.m it's gonna be expensive you just gotta shut up you gotta do it you know, because what are you, what are you going to do? You're going to let them fill up with water until you can pay regular rates at 8 a.m.? You don't. You just yeah. say, okay, heard, understood. I'm terribly sorry. We'll get a plumber there. Let us know if there's damage to anything. We're going to look after it. you got to spend a little money to prove to them that you're really about it. Because yeah. if you're not, why are you doing it? That is amazing advice, even for the time of COVID right now, of how businesses are dealing with it. I mean, it, it, this is out of nowhere. Yep. Like, no one planned for this. It might have been a bit weird that we had 10 years of pure growth and nothing bad was happening. But you know what? Now the businesses that are going to make it on the other ends are the ones yep. that said, you know what? I'm going to pay up. I'm going to take care of my employees. I'm going to take care of my clients. Yep. You know, it might be a little lean for the next couple of years, yep. but they're going to come out squeaky yep. clean and admired yep and that's really what it's about and th- that's what i had a, a problem with i think during covid is the ones that had they they i i felt for the ones who weren't eligible for any government grants mm-hmm. i wasn't you yeah. know if you were operating without any safety net any sort of savings any line of credit ugh. You know, yeah, I have a tricky. hard time feeling a little bit of remorse for the companies that, you know, took 98% of their profits and did stock buybacks to inflate their e- stock price. Because what are you going to do now? Right. Because it's worth nothing. Great. Yeah, but... I, Your loan of credit that you locked in at 2% would have been a lot more helpful right now. Yeah. And I don't feel bad because I think we have to understand, you know, we are going to lose some companies. There's going to be bankruptcies, but not everything's lost. Say an airline, the airplanes are still going to be there. 
yeah. the staff that is now just sitting at home being paid, they still have the skills and going to be available. Yeah. Shareholder equity may have got wiped out, but guess what? If the demand's there, someone's going to take the risk and start a new business. Yeah. There's opportunity. People love opportunity. And that's the thing is the ones that were meant to die, died. And yeah. that opened the market up to new people. And I'm excited for that because there's a lot of young people our age that have been just buying for a chance to start something. And now might be that great chance. Yep. So, yeah, that's the one thing I've always loved about business is I love that it's a jungle. And a game. It, yeah. Yes, yeah. You know, it's like... You could lose. Yeah, you could very much it's lose. It's a lot more fun to win. Yeah. <laughs> but I love the yeah. people that see a loss as just set back. It's just snakes and ladders. Like, yeah. You yeah. can Straight see up. it as, yeah. yeah, you got a few ladders, but then you got a snake and you're back to level one. But guess what? You can still play again. Yeah, straight up. Exactly. Just wipe it off. Like, I mean, that's not going to, I'm not going to, that's one of my favorite things in the world as I loved being punched in the mouth. It's like one of my favorite things. Yeah. I, I love losing so much because it makes the winning so glorious. I mm. have to give a shout out to one of my favorite entrepreneurs in the city that I've been so fortunate to work with and see her personal growth and professional growth. Caitlin, uh, Caitlin Burgoyne. I knew it. Kills yes. it. Um, has some best presentation on failure and what's taught her and how she's been able to come back time and time again. And I just love her uh, hunger to start new things and just always take a stab at something new, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I've been very fortunate to give her a shot and help develop the, give her the opportunity to develop the customer camp with DNS and see what she's done with that. And the new stuff she's doing now with her husband is absolutely amazing. And I love people like that. She had many opportunities before and just keeps on thriving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I've never got the chance to meet her in person. I've only just seen kind of what she does on LinkedIn and Twitter and seeing, I again, only based off of how I see how she's affected those who have interacted with her. I can tell she's a great person. Uh, cause I always go back to no one ever remembers what you said. They always remember how you made them feel. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, she seems like she's a person who makes a lot of people consistently feel good. And uh, she's some, I would love to talk to at some point. And, uh, she's actually on my, uh, so I have like a three tier list oh. uh, for the podcast guests. And she's like, I think like tier three where it's like, she's like on the high level. I'm like, I don't think I can ever get her, Yeah, but she's up there. We'll, we'll assume when we're big enough, we'll yeah. get her. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Tyler. Well, is there any of the last things that you really want to hit on before we finish off? That's that's the big thing because you're the guest, oh, you know, and please, what you, what you say goes. The big thing I want to circle back to is just I want people to think about on the other end of this COVID-19, specifically Atlantic Canada, how do we get louder about what we're doing? How do we make sure we're keeping the people here? And how do we start changing our strategy to change the culture so we're no longer saying this is good enough? What we developed, we got some tech companies, was just lean off the gas. I want to know how are we rewriting the rules, building a new engine, and going fast forward much faster. Uh, I think there's huge opportunities, uh, especially in ocean sustainability. The, yeah, uh, that's big. Big. That was Talk big about when I was in it. school, yeah. Talk like, about it. In Europe, the European Green Deal just dropped, and they're going to be dropping $100 billion over <gasps> the next 10 years for oh. sustainability companies and strategic projects. Um, the opportunity that's not Trump huge. change. Yeah. No, and we have the new trade agreement with them, CETA, where 98% of everything that had tariffs is now wiped away. And it just opened up a playing field. And right now, we're not playing that game. Absolutely uh, not. We're just not. And there's so much opportunity. And where mm. Nova Scotia is positioned, we, we I would so love much. to challenge anyone. If you want to learn about how to do business over there, reach out to me and my team. Or I challenge you, just go ahead and talk to some people over there and try to build some strategic relationships. There's not going to be any trade shows for the next couple of years, probably. You have the marketing budget now to explore other options and get it's creative. True. Yeah, it's because true. they're bringing it to you now. Yeah. You're right. It's digital. It's all online now. Yeah. I mean, conference. I've talked to companies that are like, I had 80% of my marketing budget was trade shows. What do I do now? I now it's dollars. time to get creative. Yeah. Time to create experiences. I mean, I'm sure a few people create can use a design guy going forward. Wow. Yeah. I'm always about it. I love creating experiences. That's what we do. That's what yeah. I do. I fall in love with that stuff. So how do we get people to fall in love with Nova Scotia then if we're looking out and reaching to a new country or 
the EU, many countries? Um, I think there's a couple things. I think one is, I think you said it too. I think we really, okay, I got to watch my words because I'm going to go off on different tangents because there's so many different things <laughs> about it. But like, I'm looking here down Prince Street. I see this big blue thing. And I'm not talking about the wave. I'm talking about the ocean. We have this incredible thing that we can use. As you said, like ocean sustainability, like yeah. that's humongous. There's so many things you can do with technology when it comes to ocean stuff. It's nuts. Like I, I look forward to the day where we can figure out how to use tidal power to power our cities. Major yes. Like that'd yeah. be amazing. And I can tell you right now across Canada, obviously our biggest competitor is the West Coast. Mm. But they aren't focusing on it. They're super they're heavy in clean gas. tech, yeah. and they folded kind of anything oceans into that conversation. Yeah. But we're kind of ahead where we've already built it out as a niche and know it's something we want to look at. Exactly. I mean, look how big the lobster industry is. The fact they haven't had innovation in 100 years. Mm-hmm. I want to challenge some people to focus on that. I love the challenge. Mm. That, you know, that would be a very interesting project. Right? I'm not gonna lie. Uh, for your user experience, absolutely. Um, it's like, I mean, that's been my biggest dream. I think, you know, you may have heard on my f- the first episode of the podcast where, like, my big dream is to, like, somehow redesign Nova Scotia's healthcare system. Yes. You know, that is something that really, you know, I think that's the other thing that was going to help people come here is us to actually have real healthcare. Mm-hmm. So we're hurting, if I'm being honest. We talk about healthcare every episode. We, we're starting to talk about it. Every <laughs> Shows you how much I care I was about actually it. wondering how it was going to work into this <laughs> one <laughs> because I wasn't going near it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing is... Uh, you know, if we start getting people here, we just a big part of it is we need to really figure out our healthcare system. Like, yeah. you know, I have um, you know, I have a family friend who's you know a big doctor in a rural community in Nova Scotia. You know, he's literally seen people die on hospital beds in the hallways because they have nowhere to put them. Yeah. You know, it's like that's that's yeah. where it's at, right? And so that really needs to be figured out. And so yes, let's get focused on business. Let's focus on how we can move forward. And as you said, like. Alberta is really stuck on oil. I understand why, but they got to figure out a way to move forward past it and, you know, and kind of make the transition. Uh, we have a great opportunity here where we have the future literally in our backyard uh, and we just got to learn to be able to use it. And that's how you get entice people. And so being entice people to come on a business level, but we got, we really need to do our best to really take care of ourselves on a medical level yeah. or else no one's going to come here. And I, so, yeah. I think if you nail that, you got a killer value proposition that, in yeah. our work value talking life to here, yeah. EU. They brought value life, Canada, spectacular. But because, you know, the loudest cities are Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, they're like, your cost of living's outrageous. Yeah. Now imagine if we come in underneath of that being like, check out Halifax, got the ocean, got the co- the lovely lifestyle you like. Oh, by the way, healthcare, immaculate. Yeah. Just perfect. And you're going to have companies being like, that's where I want my employees to sell in Canada. What's up? Our next office there. Yeah. And that's the only, like, so from what I've heard, especially after the Amazon proposal, mm, I yeah. know the one thing that's holding us back from other cities is our transit system. Because mm-hmm. it's trash. It's trash. And so, but the thing is, it can, I, I've seen the, some of the things that the tr- Halifax Transit's been proposing, and I like where they're going with it. I like the idea of essentially having subway lines as bus lines, essentially. Uh, that, you know, you have other bus lines off of those major lines, those major arteries. But the thing I love is that I would love for them, and they're looking at doing it, is just expanding our ferry system. You know, having five, six stops around the mm-hmm. harbor. Like, we're, we're, we live all around this harbor. Like, we have five major communities all around the harbor. North End, Bedford, Dartmouth, Eastern Passage. That Hossage, would be amazing. I South never thought Halifax. of a Bedford to Halifax ferry would be, be fantastic. You know, and you ease all the, the Bedford highway traffic. Yeah. So the people past nuts. Bedford have an easier commute in. Exactly. You know, you it's run like, a Metro X bus out there. Exactly. And it, it just makes it so much easier, you know, because like that's the thing is like people think of it as like we just have nowhere to build because like we're, you know, we're, we're stuck. We're, it, things yeah. are narrow. You open up a lot of possibilities if you can make the, the harbor, water work for you. The, our, our transit system, essentially, which would be the coolest thing. Like, literally, I was talking to my wife about this the other day. I was like, people would lay freak out if well, Halifax is like, you know, it's like, yeah, you got Toronto's got the subway and they got the buses. Well, Halifax has got boats and buses. Yeah. Like, that's nuts. I'm not going to lie. I went over the ferry today and just a couple days ago, first time 
past 10 months since I've uh, really been to living in Halifax, I missed it. Yeah. It is something I special. I love the ferry. As opposed to being in Ottawa, going on the sub um, LRT there, mm. it would. It was fantastic. I'm not going to lie. Being on the ferry and just cruising over from Dartmouth Top to floor. Halifax. It's yeah. great. Get to see some seals sometimes. Once in a awesome. while. Yeah. Yep. Seeing a few of those. It's great. If we can perfect that and bike lanes here that I can just bring a bike back and forth. Yeah. Oh, that absolutely. That would be spectacular. Dude, we have such an amazing opportunity here. Uh, you know, and I don't know. I heard some parts in the States. I think it was in the States where they, no, it's over in Europe. They're doing this. Uh, where they've literally sectioned off parts of their downtown that's just not allowed, not a lot of cars. Oh, yeah. Period. I yes. can see that happening here. So I saw, yeah, I think I saw that in Barcelona. They created a grid system, so it was like only every so many streets had mm. cars, and then within certain blocks, there was no cars allowed. They were just open walking streets. Wow. I mean, a yeah. little bit easier with a grid system, but I would love Halifax to fully embrace a few streets downtown to be walking only. I agree. That's Look at thing. Argyle right now. Yeah, Argyle. It really amazing. should be. And I it mean, is right it's now. It's designed that way. Yeah. 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 You know, so ever since COVID, yeah, they've made sure there's zero cars on that because- Not of even patties. delivery trucks. Yeah, there's no one's allowed on that now. Uh, but like, I, I don't want to, like, I think the solid core of Halifax, the downtown core, could easily be that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really, I'm not going to lie, there's really no need to have all these cars in these narrow streets it's just such a hassle yep um there's there's other ways you know, yeah there's all these other ways so mm -hmm. yeah dude this has been a great conversation this has been fantastic we've got a lot of design really challenges to tackle I now know. going forward you're talking about it you're absolutely talking about it. and that's the thing is like i look forward to uh how fast transit digitizing their payment strategy <sighs> that excites me as a big city quote unquote. i am very yeah. excited for that honestly i pin that and very excited to have that to happen that's just been uh why well, hasn't that happened yet yeah. for so long Straight and up. hopefully that's promised what's happening forward with conversations in halifax transit and maybe you know uber will come at some point so <laughs> one could hope yeah <laughs> we're in a taxi cartel here <laughs> <laughs> we do it's like a mafia. They get, They'll they break get, your kneecaps. They get so upset the second you talk about Uber. <laughs> Maybe they should work harder to make sure we don't want it so bad. Oh, man. Don't let Dalton go off now. No. Nah, like, <laughs> I have negative time for taxi drivers. He has negative time for taxi drivers. I'm not going to lie. I'm with you. Yeah. I've been spoiled everywhere else what in the country now. Disgusting model. Yeah. To get around a it feels archaic, especially being in Dartmouth and only being able to call a certain type over there yeah. because Bobs. certain won't go over there. <laughs> Bob's. Yeah. <laughs> Which I have to call three to five times to make sure to get to anyone. Coming. Yeah. That's my personal favorite. That's no. well. I mean, great people, but that's people not the way system things. should work. That I have to know what taxi company services what grid of the city. Yeah, but so in terms of biking situations, like that's one of my favorite things. I can meet my wife started biking more recently, and you know, you got the Dartmouth Trail. Mm -hmm. It's so amazing. Essentially, the trail goes from Woodside Ferry Terminal mm -hmm. all the way down to the Alderney Ferry Terminal, and it's just this amazing thing. And like, we're literally a three minute walk from it from our house, and so we just. Off on our bikes, take the trail all the way down to the ferry, get on the ferry, come across, walk the bike up here, walk, do our business, and then go yeah. back. Like it's just such an amazing. That's thing. nice. Like we really, if we really were dedicated to it, we would never need to bring our cars in the city. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just not needed. Like we can get to the ferry on a eight minute bike ride from our house, and then just walk around downtown because yeah. it's an easily walkable downtown oh, absolutely. for sure. Totally. Yeah. And that's all I do. And anytime I have business meetings now, I just I bike in now. There's no need for me to drive in. I've been on the same boat since. Uh, the no lockdown in Ontario, no I got intended. myself, right? <laughs> I got myself a bicycle and that was the one thing I will say, Ottawa bike lanes, their investment in that mm. blew my mind a difference of what it's like to bike in a city. Oh, uh, the really? fact that almost every street has a bike lane yeah. significantly wide enough that you can have two way bicycles go going each way. I like that. And it changes everything. It's just, you feel completely a different level of safety mm. versus here. Yeah. Now I will note anyone that hasn't been to Halifax, uh, it's a different level of anxiety driving in this city. Yeah. Straight up. I wish there was a, we could get a view of the, the city on the camera there, but you just can't. But 
Yeah, it's these these streets are pretty narrow. I have to admit. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I yeah. like going fast down them, so it's kind of challenging for bike riders. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're in my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to go 80 on these 50 streets. <laughs> and for you anyone that doesn't know, we have many many hills here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of things. You, like right biking, here is like all hill. Yeah, if you're biking, you gotta be fit. I'm yeah, sure. unless you're just willing to go down Barrington. Yeah. Not up. Oh, yeah. You're going to go that way. Yeah. <laughs> Straight up. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. It was really great to have you on. Oh, thank really you, guys. A yeah. You really, like, honestly, this has been such a great conversation. Uh, you a lot we talked about insight. a lot. Yeah. I know, yeah. I know you're you're on your way back to uh, the homeland, the capital. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi to Justin for me. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Vote to fly into a heat uh, wave. But oh, they have, what, 45, 50 over there now? It's close to there. Uh, a little it. less humidity than here, though. You're leaving to a heat wave. Yeah. yeah. Uh, love that well thank you so much and have a safe flight yeah. oh thank yeah, you guys indeed. much appreciated and congrats yeah. on this it's this been fantastic oh. and i look forward to the next ones oh thank you anyway we're so grateful to have you on yeah man. thank you so much for coming on and taking the time out lovely all right all right this is it we're out see you